made to move out of their homes. People weren't being made to move out of their homes, maybe because of issues unrelated to their pet. But when people had more stable housing and were allowed to stay in their homes with their families, they tended to keep their pets with them. So we saw a reduction in owner surrenders during the months of COVID. Of COVID. The other issue we have is with that term housing, right? So on the 24 Pet Watch data and the data that the shelters collect, the term housing can refer to maybe you're moving and you have a hard time transporting your dog from one place to another. Maybe you don't have insurance. Maybe your dog was disclaimed by your insurance company. Maybe your landlord changed the policies and you can no longer have a dog who looks like the dog on this, on this slide. So housing encompasses a lot of different things. And the other thing that we don't really know is when a landlord says, you can't have a pit bull terrier type dog, or you can't have a dog that's over 35 pounds. Is that landlord's preference or is that coming from the insurance company? So we have a little more digging into the data before we can really get into the barriers that are uh, resulting in families surrendering their beloved pets to shelters. Let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit more about the actual problem with insurance. Fantastic. So homeowners liabilities, insurance policies. Most of us, all of us, I would venture, live in a home that has a homeowners liability insurance policy that covers the home. Even if you rent, you have your own renter's insurance, but your landlord has a policy that covers that home as their own property. State Farm, Chubb, and USAA are three national companies that don't ban breeds of dogs in their policies. That's it. Those are the only three companies that serve many states in the nation, not every state because State Farm doesn't write in Florida, right? So the, the three largest insurance companies that don't have any kind of breed restriction in their policies. The dogs that you see on the screen, Pitbull Terriers, Dobermans, Rottweilers, all of those breeds are restricted or banned from coverage in most, if not all, insurance policies for homeowners. I want to talk to you about how this has impacted me personally, because on the screen, you will see Murphy, otherwise known as Best Boy, and he is a dog that came into my life when we adopted him almost 13 years ago as a pup. For the longest time, we thought Murphy was a flat coat retriever. That's what the vet said. That's what the shelter said. And... For some fun, we got a DNA test one Christmas, uh, two years ago now, to see what Murphy was. And I don't know if right now you guys are all thinking and making your educated guesses on what Murphy is, because he sure looks like a flat coat retriever mix to me. But his DNA came back that he was a lot Labrador, but he was also Chow Chow and Boxer. What do you suppose my insurance company uh, wouldn't cover for a dog that I owned? <laughs> a chow chow and a boxer. <laughs> so now we're in a position of having to negotiate with our homeowner's insurance policy about whether Murphy is gonna be able to be covered or how we're gonna proceed with that. So um, that's my own personal experience. I imagine some of you also have experiences with your family pets and, uh, and finding insurance that covers them. So we'll go to the next slide and talk about how we're gonna reach the resolution to this problem with insurance. Ideally, the free market will result in a change. We're starting to talk with insurance companies on a higher level and trying to talk them into, um, them into changing their policies to more reflect State Farm and USAA. But in the places where that's not happening, we're gonna go ahead and push for laws that require insurance companies to cover families as they are, regardless of what breed of dog that you have. So Nevada was the most recent state to pass a law, and Nevada's law says that insurance companies cannot refuse to issue, cancel, non-renew, and they can't increase the premium based solely on the breed of dog that family owns. Pennsylvania has had a similar law for a much longer period of time. And then Michigan also has a law that says essentially that insurance is... Um, it's an essential insurance act. So it's an essential service to families and they can't deny that based on the breed of dog you have. So those are our three uh, states that have laws on the books 
that address prohibiting insurance breed bans. We are still waiting for the new governor's signature in New York. We're just activating uh, our, our advocacy there to ask that the governor sign the bill that's been passed by the legislature and she has until October to do that. But if you're, your, if you're in New York, you may see an alert on that coming up. And we still have bills that are alive in Massachusetts that would propose to do the same thing. Say insurance companies can't deny coverage based on the breed of a dog. We have some other interesting bills that are or laws that are enacted both in Massachusetts and in Illinois that are data collection bills or data collection laws. Illinois is brand new this year. Massachusetts is two years old now. But what those laws say is that insurance companies must report dog related incidents to the uh, Department of Insurance or the insurance commissioner. The goal of that is to determine how many dog related incidents there are, and in a perfect world, what breed of dogs cause those incidents. But when we look at the Massachusetts data, we see so many of those dogs are being identified solely on visual identification. And what do we know about that? It's incredibly unreliable and inaccurate. So we can't look at this dog in this picture and say with certainty whether he's a lab mix, whether he's a mastiff, whether he's an amstaff. So visual identification we know is, is incredibly inaccurate. But the other interesting thing that I don't think the insurance companies were counting on is the number one breed responsible for incidents in 2020 was a Labrador retriever. So, We'll analyze that data as it continues to come in and use that to argue our case more and more effectively that insurance should not be predicated on the breed of a dog. <clears throat> so let's go on to the next slide. Hey, Kelsey. Last... Yes. Re real quick before we continue, um, some folks wanted to know the three insurance companies that don't discriminate um, uh, against breed. Yeah, thanks for that, Carol. It's State Farm, USAA, and Chubb, C-H-U-B-B. Thanks, Caitlin. Are there any other questions that I should pause for here? Yeah, we actually have a few questions. Um, and going back to the slide with like the data, um, Sharon was mm -hmm. asking if the data is focused, the data is mainly for dogs. The... No, the data was for pet inclusive housing in general. So it may have, um, it could affect cats if you live someplace that said you can only have three pets um, and maybe you had four cats. So primarily we see dogs being surrendered. You know, again, the number one reason that dogs are surrendered to shelters by their homes is for housing issues. So we know that this issue really impacts the dogs that are coming into shelters, but it can also affect cats. Uh, if you move into a place, you know, say there are some places in Illinois that restrict the weight of a cat. <laughs> and I know there are some big, some big fat cats out there that may be uh, restricted from different housing places based on their weight. So it is an issue for cats as well, but not quite as prevalent as it is for dogs. Cool. Thank you for answering that. Um, there's another question, uh, if you don't mind answering from Chris. She asked, how does insurance verify dog breed? Are they, are you required to have a relay DNA test? So on your, whenever you go to renew your homeowner's insurance, look at your application and what it's going to say is, do you have a dog? And you say yes. And then it says, what kind of dog? So they're asking you to verify what kind of dog you have. Before I had a DNA test on Murphy, I just said flat coat retriever mix. But now that I know what he is, I'm in a position like many Americans are of just continuing to put down flat coat retriever mix because that's what it's been for the last 13 years or disclosing that he's a chow chow boxer mix and having to find a new insurance policy. So right now they're, they're using primarily the owner's testimony or the owner's statement about what breed of dog you have. There can be issues uh, if there is an incident in the home even if it's unrelated to the dog, if there's um, a fire or somebody 
slips and hurts themselves on your front step and they find out that your dog is in fact a banned breed, the insurance company can cause some problems for you with that. So even if the incident uh, that you try to make a claim for is unrelated to the dog, if you have a dog that was should have been disclosed and was not disclosed, disclosed the insurance company um, is going to give you some some hard times paying out those claims. Gotcha. Thank you. And then well, we you're at it just because there were a okay. lot of questions about it, Kelsey. Um, I guess my question would be that does kind of open up the door to a lot of gray area, right? Because if you run into a problem and the insurance company is trying to find a way to get around it and your dog is an easy out, there is potential for them to challenge you on what kind of breed your dog is. And that can open up the door to a whole can of worms for you, right? That's what you're right, thinking. right. And that's part of the problem we're seeing in the data. Um, the data reports that are coming out of Massachusetts is very few dogs are identified on DNA or AKC or UKC breed papers. The vast majority are self-identified by the owner or are um, uh, visually identified by presumably the adjuster <laughs> who's looking at the claim. So it's in general, it goes back to the to the very similar arguments that y'all have heard for years about why breed specific anything is inappropriate, unreliable, and inaccurate because we can't identify breeds based on visual, visual identity, nor can we say with any certainty that certain breeds of dogs are riskier or more dangerous than other dogs. Because if you look at the 2020 data out of Massachusetts, the number one most dangerous breed of dog was a Labrador Retriever. <laughs> so we know that just because your dog looks a certain way doesn't mean it's a higher risk. And there's actually a way, if we'll go to the next slide, uh, this is how we're hoping to track this information and really bring it to the attention of insurance commissioners and departments of insurance in different states. So you'll see the website down on the bottom. Uh, we are working with other stakeholders in the animal welfare movement, particularly on this issue of insurance and housing stability to make reports to insurance commissioners when people are denied insurance or when they have housing disruption because of insurance because of the breed of their dog. So we're educating shelters on when they get owner surrenders that are for housing issues. If you, you know, once we find that out and then we say, well, if it was an insurance issue or if your landlord is denying you because of insurance, please go to this website, contact your insurance commissioner and file a complaint. So on this website, there are complaint go bys. This is just a screenshot, so it's not an it's not the active site. But when you scroll down here, there are complaint go bys. There are sample emails and letters that people can use to submit to their insurance commissioners. Um, and this is a really good way for us to proactively contact the insurance commissioners when there's been disparate treatment because of your dog's breed. Um, but I'm gonna pass this over to Katie to talk a little bit more about what y'all can do on this issue. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, hi guys, I'm Katie Kahabka. I'm in Buffalo, New York, and I'm actually um, an intern on the grassroots advocacy team. So there's my email, feel free to, to reach out. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about kind of the, the grassroots piece of this, right? So we heard from Kelsey, all of the harm that this can cause, this insurance issue, but what can you do about it, right? So if we go to the next slide, um, so some of you may have seen this site already. Some of you, this might be brand new. Um, so what we did is we launched a, a grassroots effort, right, um, targeting states and insurance commissioners, commissioners in each of the states to say, hey, we want you to pass regulations to essentially outlaw the practice of either denying coverage, dropping coverage, or raising premiums for dogs based on breeds. So this is the site and basically you can just go to bestfriends.org slash pets or family and we'll have that um, link for you in the um, attachment at the end. But what you can do is you can put in your state, 
and it'll pull up your state petition and you can go ahead and sign that petition. So why are we petitioning at the state level? Insurance is regulated state by state. So, you know, why do we have 46 petitions? You know, why don't we just do it at the federal level? Well, insurance is regulated at the state level. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that the insurance commissioners understand that the constituents within the state, um, they don't want this practice to go on. Um, as Kelsey had mentioned, it's ineffective. There's really no, no good way to identify a dog um, just based on looking at them, what their breed is. Oftentimes, you know, there's been a lot of studies that you go to a shelter and I think one study I looked at, it was 87% of the time, the breed mix that they told you was incorrect when compared against DNA analysis. So it's, it's really not at all, you know, a good way. And also every dog should be judged as an individual. So to say a certain breed of dog, whether it be an Akita or a Chow Chow or a Pitbull type dog is going to be more aggressive or more risky than another, um, that, you know, there's no science to back that either. So you can go to the site, type in your state's name, sign the petition. Um, that is a really great first start. We also have a little area when you sign, you can actually put in a story about if this has happened to you or if this happened to someone you know, because sharing your stories is what really kind of takes this abstract con concept and makes it real and puts a face to the issue. So, you know, sharing your stories, we really, really encourage that. Um, if you don't see your state listed, um, as Kelsey had mentioned, there are some states where there's already laws on the books or there's bills in the process of being signed. So for example, if you're in New York and you go to type in New York, um, there's nothing to sign there. However, we do link to the site that Kelsey had mentioned where, you know, just because you live in a state where technically an insurance company is not allowed to have breed restrictions, um, people still find that there's issues, right? I mean, not all of the insurance companies play by the rules. <laughs> and also, you know, certain, you know, insurance um, agents, they may not even realize, right? So if you come into an issue and you're in one of these states where the laws are already passed, you can go to this site and file a complaint. So if we go to the next slide, Can we um, advance to the next slide? April, are you frozen? Oh no! I got a quick second here. Let me. Oh, we got it. Oh, there it is. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so, once you sign the petition. What else can you do, right? I mean, you're here because you want to make a difference. So a couple easy ways to help. First, step one, once you sign, um, the system kind of gives you the ability to share. So you can share the petition with, you know, make a goal of sending it to three friends or three family members. You know, a little bit goes a long way because they sign it, maybe they're sharing it with a few people and that can really kind of, you know, extrapolate out to a lot of impact. So that's kind of step one. Step two, we put together this graphic um, that you can put on your social media. And this really will link you to our, you know, keeping pets and families together. So our insurance initiative. And this is a great way to get a little bit of a more far reaching audience. So you can share this on your Facebook, your Instagram, Twitter. Um, it'll really help to get the word out. You never know who you might reach with these types of, of graphics. You know, you might have, you know, a lot of followers on social media. They'll see it. They'll go to the website, sign the petition, share with their friends. So again, it'll make a really big impact and it doesn't take a lot of time for you to do that as an advocate. So step three, if you really want to get involved, um, what I've been working on specifically as part of my internship is connecting with people in the community to really push out this petition and, and gain more traction on it. So I'll explain kind of what I mean by that. So there is a lot of other 
organizations or activists in the community who may not be centered necessarily around animal welfare, but who may still have a vested interest in keeping pets with their families. Because what happens is, you know, another aspect of this is if, if someone loses their insurance or they're not able to, you know, find an apartment with their specific breed of dog, there's also people who would rather live on the streets. They would literally rather be homeless than give up their, their pets. Because as we say, pets are family, right? So, you know, you might have food banks in your local community who see people that have lost their job because, you know, they, they couldn't find an apartment to live with their animal and they couldn't have, you know, steady housing and they couldn't find steady transportation. And so as a result, maybe they're, they're utilizing the food bank services. Um, so there might be people there who really see in real time the impact that these policies can have on people. Um, other, other services for those that are unhoused, right? So maybe places that um, give out clothing or shelters or, you know, services that help people to find jobs. These might be organizations that you can connect with that would really have a vested interest in kind of campaigning for these types of laws on the books because ultimately when pets are homeless, it can affect the people too. And so these kind of community-based organizations, they may be people-centered, but they may really have a, a, an impact that they can kind of provide to, to our campaign here. So connecting with them can really help to sort of find those shared, um, those shared goals. And, you know, maybe they can push it out to their followers. Maybe they can help you with signing the petition and, and really kind of showing support. So getting that grassroots on the ground buy-in from groups within your community is really going to make this go a lot further. Um, another good one to look at is maybe domestic violence shelters or services that help um, victims of domestic abuse. Um, a lot of data shows that people who are experiencing abuse in the home, oftentimes there's animal abuse in the home as well. And a lot of people who are being abused, they don't want to leave their pets, right? Because they know that 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 pet is being left with an abuser. So they'll choose to stay because they don't want to leave their pets. So just as an example, one of the states that I'm looking at as one of our kind of key states is Arizona. And one of the domestic violence shelters actually in August is having a fundraiser specifically for pets and having pet housing in their domestic violence shelters because they realize that there's people that won't leave their abuser because of their pets. And so they really understand how important it is to keep pets with their people. So, you know, reaching out to these organizations, introducing yourself, trying to sort of talk to them about this initiative is really going to go a long way. Um, it's something I've been working on. So certainly if you're at all interested in doing that or kind of taking the reins on pushing this out to some more organizations within your within your community, um, please reach out to me. I would be happy to, you know, help you. Um, reach out to the action team email. And I think it would be, you know, a really great way to sort of get a little deeper um, in the advocacy within this. And lastly, you know, if you're interested in kind of taking taking charge and taking a leadership role for maybe your state, um, we're always happy to, to have leaders of, of individual petitions too. So again, just email us, email me, send the action team an email, and we would love to kind of work with you and, and help you on that. So I will, um, unless there's questions, I'm going to kick it back to, to Caitlin to sort of do a Q&A and, and wrap up. Katie and Kelsey. Um, yes, we have a lot of questions. So feel free to pop them in the chat and we will answer them. Um, and I think the fact that you guys have had so many questions throughout the, the course of this conversation shows why it's so important. Um, and from hearing Kelsey and Katie, this is a topic that is very intersectional. It crosses over so many different lanes. But the other piece of it that's so important is there's so much gray, right? Like almost every single question you've asked Kelsey, she doesn't have 
a direct yes or no answer because there isn't one. <laughs> like She's a pro at this. She's been working at this all around the nation. And that's part of the problem is that this kind of breed selective regulation does not determine anything that an animal can prevent. It's not their behavior. I mean, certainly a cat weighing 15 pounds as opposed to 10 pounds is not going to impact any liability for your insurance company. And yet we have seen that. So I think it's important for us to realize that part of the issue here is the fact that right now with the way that insurance companies are choosing who they cover and who they don't and who gets a higher premium, it's not based on anything that actually impacts liability. And it is up for a lot, a lot of negotiation and debate. So let me try to pull up the questions here and multitask you guys. Um, Lisa said, do you ever work with companies, employee resource groups on these issues? Have you looked into that, Katie, in your work? The resource groups? I haven't, but I'd be curious to hear from Lisa a little bit more detail on what she means by that, because I would I would love to consider that. Lisa, do you want to unmute or do you want to type it in the chat? Yeah, I, I can unmute. Um, hi, everyone. So my company is actually just kicking off employee resource groups. And right now they're all centered around things that tie directly to our business. So I, I just wondered if this was something you've already maybe been involved in in any larger corporations that maybe uh, sell product into uh, you know, you know like pet, pet suit, pet companies that, that provide products for, for pets. Is this something that you've ever given them any guidance on or helped them organize, helped companies organize events for this type of community outreach in a, in a structured way? We haven't yet, but we would definitely love to. So, I mean, I think that's a big opportunity to work with companies and their local communities. So okay. I'd love to chat with you more about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'll pop that in the chat and I'll look to bring it up. And then we do have a bunch more questions, you guys. So let's see. I'm going to start with the short ones. <laughs> we'll get to the long ones. Sarah wants to know who generally opposes the legislation changes, Kelsey. Yeah, so typically it's uh, it's the insurance companies, right? Because we're asking them to cover more things. And in their mind, we're asking them to increase their risk. And they've been able to do what they've been doing for decades without having to change it. So typically we see opposition, uh, largely from insurance companies, which are, are a pretty strong lobbying arm as, as we can guess, so. And the other question is actually around HOAs. We have two people um, who are wondering around about how do they deal with HOA breed discrimination? Oofta. That's a tough one um, because HOAs, it's, it's, a, it's a private organization, right, of homeowners. So um, the short answer is change your HOA rules, uh, talk to the board or try to get on the board and change the rules and regulations with the HOA. Um, we certainly have all of the data and the information that you would need on our website about why anything breed specific is problematic and uh, discriminates against families who own those types of dogs. Um, and then there's also a pretty substantial link that, that some researchers out of Harvard are showing that they're, you know, people are using a breed of a dog as a way to discriminate against a, a people who look a certain way. And I think uh, particularly in California, that might be problematic for the folks on the board there. And they may want to, to talk about being a little more inclusive in that regard. So um, start, with, start with our website and start with the items on there that talk about repealing breed specific laws and breed specific policies. Use those arguments to ask your board at your HOA to get rid of that restriction. Um, the other more complicated way that I think we could potentially go about it is if your state 
has a law that says that you cannot restrict, you can't consider a dog dangerous by virtue of breed alone. Um, it'd be pretty tricky to link the state law to a private organization, but I think the state law could go in your argument to say, look, the city can't ban a breed, so the state disfavors it. Why are we doing it and discouraging people from one, adopting animals from our local shelter and two, moving into our community at all? Because if they have this kind of dog, they're not going to move into our home and my property values might be diminished because I have a much smaller set of people that I can sell my house to. So we can get kind of creative with it. If you want help putting something together or just want to bat some ideas around, you can certainly give me an email. I'll add on to that, Kelsey, too. Um, John, I know you said in here that you only get a handful of people at meetings, but we do also have the ability to create petitions and it's free to you guys. Like we can walk you through the process. And one thing I will say is that we know that a lot of times people struggle to attend events, <laughs> but they may actually support you. So you may be able to use the information that we have to build a really thoughtful case about why they should change the way that they're regulating the homes in your area but you could also potentially build out a little bit of a community support for you mm -hmm. about how people really wanna see that change. So we'd be happy to work with you on it and you could put some feelers out in your community and we can help you with that and kind of get a feel for where people are at in your community as well. So mm -hmm. if you wanna- If you get a, email, a handful of people who will work on that with you, you can essentially get a proxy from them. And that way you can show up at the meeting with you know, 800 proxies and there you have it. <laughs> yep. So, so we, we can, can find a solution. Sort that out. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, so does that give you a starting place, John? Kind of, I'm on the covenants committee for the HOA. So we enforce the rules and we have some, I, I have issues around the pet discrimination. It's not just the pit, pit bull specific um, rule, but also the the number of dogs, they only say two pets in total. We used to have, we moved in with three pets. We had a cat who passed away last year, but so we all, we're down to two dogs, but the municipal code allows more, it seems. So it seems like the HOA is in violation, conflicts with the municipal code in our city here. Um, but also that other members of the Covenants Committee do not feel the same way about, as I do about breed discrimination. They, one of them openly says that she moved to our HOA because they had the ban on pit bulls. So, um, so there's that kind of sentiment, I think, in the HOA. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting position, too, because you're, you know, in a bit of a leadership role. So it would be interesting to see what other people in your community feel as well, um, especially given what we know now versus what we probably was out there when your HOA was formed, although I don't know how it's old 20, <laughs> 20, about 20 years. It's been the, yeah, they're, go back to 99, I think, was the, uh, the covenants were written, I think. So. There you go. A lot has definitely changed in 20 years. And no, there's other stupid, yeah, there's stupid things. On, uh, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but some stupid rules on there, too, about, um, about you can't use rubber mulch. Like, you, I, I, <laughs> yeah, but anyway. You're supposed to use wood mulch only. It has to be a specific. I don't have problems with the colors, but you can't use rubber mulch, which is last 10 years compared to wood mulch, which only lasts a year. So there's no reason why something like that would still be in the HOA rules. <laughs> it's just things like that. <laughs> HOAs are fun. <laughs> yes, yeah, so they, they, they have a benefit too for your property values. But um, unfortunately, there was a there was a pit attack. At, no, so there was a dog that appears to be a, a, a pit type breed that did attack another dog on the street. We saw the video in our committee meetings, which I guess would help with uh, not help the case of removing the restriction, uh, you know, from our HOA. Yeah. But well, send us an email because Katie yeah. has done a lot of research so she can connect you with a bunch of things. Okay. Thank you. Sorry to hijack the conversation. No, no, this <laughs> is important. This is what we do here. <laughs> not at all. I just was reading Katie in the chat. So uh, we can... We can help you navigate that. I know it's tricky and appreciate you guys taking the lead in your community because I know it's it's hard, especially when it's not a popular opinion. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be an uphill battle on this one, so. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and I also just wanna take a minute. I know Eric had asked a question in the chat like, and it got buried. Eric, can you email us at Action 2025? Because I think we, we have some stuff that we can work with you on um, around no-kill language and 
think you live in California. Did you say you lived in California? Me? Uh, yeah. uh, Eric. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'll, send, I'll send you an email. I don't know if you can hear me. I'll send you an email. That'd be great. That would be perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any last minute questions, you guys? I know I, we may have missed some and we have the links popped up here. So if you want to ask any last minute questions, now's your time. If not, I do want to just send a reminder to you guys. After you leave this call, if you can either share a petition out, if you see one from your local area, share it with three friends or family members, every single person counts and it really does make an impact. Or share the social media graphic, just pop it on your Facebook page, your Instagram. I don't really understand TikTok, but if you TikTok, <laughs> maybe so you can sort that out. Um, and just help us kind of spread the word because it is a topic that's coming up more and more and really is impactful to people, especially today. And we could really use your help getting it out there and growing the army. With that. So did, did Katie provide her contact? I, I put my email address in there. Uh, Katie, email you... us at action2025 at Best Friends, and we'll connect you with Katie. Action2025 at yeah. Best Friends? Okay. Yes. Because her last name is, sorry, Katie, but it's a trick to spell. <laughs> that <one? Yeah. laughs> so that'll be the easiest one for you to remember. Okay. Well, I can do that. Well, thank you all so much. It was great to see you all. Thank you, Kelsey and Katie, for your expertise. And we'll see you next month, if not before. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, y'all. Bye-bye.